Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to continue to study your word together. We're so grateful for your love, your grace, your mercy. We're so aware of just how little we know. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We ask that the Holy Spirit filter out all of that which is foolish, sealing to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been uh, studying together in the uh, epistle to the first Corinthians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, uh, we were in the 10th verse of chapter 3. You know, I think that we all agree that we have a loving Heavenly Father. And not only does He love us and, and by His grace that He's redeemed us uh, and blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, but uh, He's given us His Word. And I think He's given us His Word as a Father who loves us, who wants us to comprehend. I don't think that He's given anything in, in some secret language uh, where that you need some kind of uh, special code, you know, to understand it. We have his word. I think he's speaking to us simply as his children. And he expects us to, to take him at his word. You know, it's always uh, interested me and amazed me to, to some extent, you know, that, that God is, he's, He's never pulled any punches when it comes to him being sovereign. If you follow this channel, you know where I stand on the sovereignty of God. It is, it's the Lord who directs our steps. Uh, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And there's none else. He says, I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace. I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Um, there, there's an abundance of verses on his sovereignty, uh, in whom also we've obtained an, an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. Uh, for it's God who works in us both the will and do of his good pleasure, the verses just continue going on and on and on. And no man, no man could have written uh, those things. And, I, and I've only read just a, a few. There's much more in Scripture that speaks of the power and the determinate will of God uh, down through the, the period of time, down through the centuries. Men... Uh, particularly theologians have wrestled with what they call the tension between God's sovereignty and man's free will. Uh, and personally, I don't think that any such contradiction, any such stress or difficulty or tension exists between God's sovereignty and man's free will. If we, if we look at the dictionary, you know, the simple definition of the word will is desire, and your desires are not free. You know, uh, I have a deep desire for Dr. Pepper, and my, my mother, uh, God rest her soul, who apparently was not of my lineage, had no desire for Dr. Pepper. You know, which meant that she really wasn't quite human. You know, neither one of us have any control over what we call desire. You know, you do not control your desires. You just have them. And they're not free. Uh, verse 10 in chapter 3, here is one of the, the crucial verses of that supposed conflict between God's sovereignty and man's volition. Uh, if you'll let me use that word rather than free will. It is God who declared 
that he is the one who builds the building. And in the 10th verse, here in chapter 3, you know, we hit the phrase, let every man take heed how he builds. So what difference does it make? I mean, uh, I mean let's think about this for a moment. God's building uh, the building. He's doing the building. It's his building, and he's doing the building. He's the sovereign God. It's the very, it's going to be the way God wants it, so it shouldn't matter how we build. You know, God is sovereign. In fact, it, it says just a few verses before that you're, uh, that we are God's field and we're God's building, and the increase is of God. Now, if the increase is of God, it doesn't matter what you do. You know, uh, follow me along here. I, this is not as bad as it sounds here. We read that whatsoever God wills, he does. Uh, and then just to read, let every man take heed how he builds. Now, why is that? That's, that's my question. Why? Uh, Romans 13, the last verse of the chapter, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Why? I mean, if if everything that happens in my life is is God's sovereign will, we're told that every one of us, everyone, will give an account of ourselves before God. Why? Why? I mean, if God is sovereign, why will we give an account of ourselves before God? I mean, isn't it he who works in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure? Is that true or is that not? I mean, isn't it uh, he who's, who's done whatsoever he pleased in heaven and in earth and in the deep sea and in every place? Is that true or is it not? Isn't it God who directs men's steps? It is not in man to direct his steps. You know, isn't it man uh, who casts the lot in the lap, but God determines the disposing thereof? Yes, it is. You know, Jacob, uh, you know, he has 12 kids. They're uh, not all from the same wife, but, but they are his kids. And they're a, a typical, you know, human lot. I guess, and, and uh, you know, the kids didn't like Joseph because of the way that their father favored him. You know, I even made him a, a special coat. Uh, and then Jacob, you know, he, he sends Joseph out to see how his brothers are doing. You know, you all know the story. And so here comes Joseph. You know, let's kill him. You know, they're going to kill him. You know, and, and Reuben, he sort of uh, interceded, didn't think that they really ought to kill the kid, you know. And so they, they put him down in a pit or that uh, he would have died anyway. But then they had this brilliant idea, you know, of selling him to some people on their way to Egypt. Now, you know, were they wrong? Uh, you know, well, I believe they're, they were wrong. Did they make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, its desires, its volition? Well, absolutely. You know, we get rid of that kid and he won't share in the inheritance and he won't be dad's favorite uh, son anymore. Uh, but we have him down in Egypt. And Joseph says to him, you know, you, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now think about that. And then let me ask you a simple question. Uh, do you think uh, that Joseph's brother will stand before God and give an account for what they did? Well, well, uh, the word says that they will. Did they do the will of God? Yes. But did they not make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust? Yes, they did. You are not going to change. 
God allows you to either plan evil or good. Jacob's brethren plan to kill their brother. They, they made provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, so clearly his brethren thought it for evil. They made provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Uh, isn't it that in the planning and the fulfilling uh, of the lust of the flesh, did they fulfill the word of God, the will of God? Did they fulfill the will of God? Did, did the scribes and the Pharisees and, and, and the people that were conniving together, you know, bringing in false witnesses to condemn and crucify our Lord, uh, did they, did they thwart God's will? Did they change his plan? Well, absolutely not. You know, the only thing that could have happened, you know, is that Christ be condemned and die on a cross. Yet we are going to read that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, why? Why, folks, why if God is supremely sovereign? God wanted Joseph sold in Egypt. God designed that Christ die on the cross. You know, they were all what God intended, what God designed, what he decreed. It was all what God willed and determined to, to be. So why should anyone give an accounting? That's my question. I guarantee you, based on the word of the sovereign God, you will give an accounting, all right? But not for your sin, absolutely not. But for your attitude. Uh, we're going to be talking about motive here just a little bit. There's therefore now no condemnation to those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Most Christians under, have read that verse. You understand that verse. And that's wonderful truth, okay? That's great news. That's thrilling news, okay? But it doesn't mean that you will not give an accounting. It doesn't mean you won't stand before God and give an account for your life. Now, did you plan this? Did you make provision for the flesh? You know, I, I have talked to men who, who spend hours conniving and planning how that they're going to get around doing, you know, what they want to do and nobody finding it out. You know, it's what the very verse is talking about. Uh, it, it, it's totally correct. It's right that I should tell you not to make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Don't do that. Okay. And to some degree, every one of us do. You know, and I, I have never taught not from this channel or from any pulpit. I've never taught that we don't have any responsibility, you know, before God. We do. Let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. We're told to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Okay, we looked at that when we studied through the epistle to the Ephesians. Well, why? Why? Uh, because your loving Heavenly Father asked you. What's your attitude? You know, I, I believe firmly that Joseph's brethren will give an account, not for what they did, okay, but why they did it, why they wanted to do it. And and I expect to give uh, that same count, uh, kind of accounting. Why I did what I did, okay? You know, uh, you know, okay, you know, let's see. I, okay, I, I started this church so that I could make millions of dollars and become famous, and you guys all let me down. All right. Do uh, you understand what I'm talking about? Making no provision for the for the to fulfill the lusts thereof. And 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 you know, uh, y'all may laugh, but you know, many and many a man has done that, is doing that. You know, I don't know of a seminary, maybe maybe it exists somewhere, but I don't know of a seminary that doesn't teach you that if your church isn't growing, it's not a spiritual church. That's kind of what they drill into you, you know, in Bible college. 
I'm, I'm of the mind that if it's growing rapidly in numbers, it probably isn't a spiritual church. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I'll leave that with God. But I'm told to take heed how I build, and you have to take heed how you build, but you're not going to change the building. Do you understand what I'm, I'm, I'm saying here? We were just told that the increase is of God, not of you. You know, it's not of Paul or Apollos or, or you or me. Uh, uh, it's, like, it's like, you know, oh, Lord, it's that time again. I clean for God. I got to publish a video tomorrow, you know, so, you know, I'd, I'd better prepare. You know, is that the way that we serve the Lord, folks? Is that how we serve him? You know, I'm sure no idol of virtue, but, you know, I, I don't want to stand here and say, you know, uh, Lord, I haven't made any preparation. I don't know what this book says. I don't know what the text says. I don't know how to interpret this verse. I know full well that I'm going to give an account for how I spent my time and why I did it. I can tell you, pastors by the thousands, you know, launch into a message on, you know, what you're building with, you know, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, you know, and we got this building going up, you know, this, uh, this wood, hay, stubble, that's, that part's going to fall down or, or that part's going to be burned up, you know, uh, you know, they're, I've given you some examples. Joseph's brothers, the, you know, the Pharisees. How about a battlefield surgeon? You know, you know, he's, you know, cuts off a, a leg. It's an evil act, but he did it for the right reasons. I mean, you know, why want, uh, why do you study this book? You know, why do you feed his sheep? You know, it's not that it doesn't say that you're building with this. It says how you build. Okay. It's how you build the building is God's. The text clearly says the building is God's, that the increase is God's. You know, and, and some say, well, precious stone there, well, that means granite and concrete because, you know, that's really precious in the building industry. And, you know, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know, how are you building? Let every man take heed how he builds upon this foundation. It's Christ. You know, is it wood, hay, stubble, or is it gold, silver, precious stone? You know, it's going to be examined by God's holiness, God's fire. There won't be any, any way at all to disguise wood, hay, stubble, you know, as something good. You know, it's going to burn up. It's going to go up in smoke. So let every man take heed how he builds on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You know, I think we could spend a whole lot of time, which yeah, I don't want to do, you know, criticizing, you know, many of the works that are uh, called works done for Christ. But, but folks, what is your purpose? What is your plan? All right. Is it, is it to kill Joseph and get rid of a nasty little brat that you don't love? All right. Or is it to serve God? You know, and you can come back and, and, and tell me, well, you know, they had no idea what Joseph would do in Egypt. Uh, uh, his brothers couldn't sit there and say, well, you know, uh, if, if we sold him to Egypt, you know, he'd become second in command of Pharaoh and he'd actually save our lives by providing us food in a famine. Oh, come on, they couldn't do that. You know that they couldn't do that. But they didn't have to plan, make provision for the flood. They didn't have to plan to do what they did. You know, but it would have happened. Okay. Those of you who want to push me, you could say, you know, wasn't it God's sovereign plan that they did this? Well, absolutely. So it would teach you and me a lesson to not do it. Our text here says, let every man take heed how he builds. How he builds. Present tense. That's a present tense. Let him constantly 
be concerned about how he's building on the foundation that's Jesus Christ. Is it for the glory and the majesty of Christ? Is it for the good of the body of Christ, regardless of anything for me? Or is it something that I, I feel that I have to do? I'm obligated to do this. You know, because if I don't, well, then I'm going to be in trouble. You know, or, you know, or, you know, or maybe, maybe I'd get better known, you know, if I do. You know, you know all of those things, just all of those things that are of the flesh. They're really there. They're hard to ignore. And God commands us. This is not a request. It's a command. It's an imperative. He commands us, let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. And, and I think that's important because there's no other foundation that can be laid. The foundation is that Jesus Christ became your kinsman redeemer. He became your substitute that he died in your place so that your sin debt is paid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. No man can lay any other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And uh, that's a present indicative. It really is always Jesus Christ, okay? So anything else is wrong. And this book that we're studying is the testimony of the person in the work of Jesus Christ. It's not a rule book on how to live your Christian life. You know, and we've got an awful lot of sermonizing that goes on that seems constantly involved with what you ought to do. You know, whereas we ought to submit ourselves unto God and he'll bring it to pass. What we are doing, dearly beloved, is building on Christ, and that is the truth of this book. That's the truth of his word. Let every man take heed. You know, how, how just how diligent are, are each one of us in searching out the truth of God's word. Our loving heavenly Father commands us to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of, of truth. It's a command. You know, I, I would I I'd hate for any one of us here to take an inventory of just how much time that we spend really studying this book, how much time we really spend rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, how how many hours is it? You know, given everything that we see going on, how many hours is it compared to all the other distractions? And I understand that we all have personal responsibilities. I understand that. I know that all of that is true. But where is your heart? I think Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, will have to do with motive, with the heart. You know, and I want to be careful because I don't want to make a false application of Scripture, but it appears to me, you know, because the branch, we know from John chapter 15, the branch doesn't bear fruit, but the vine does. Our life's work is a work of God that is built upon only one foundation, that foundation being Christ, who himself is the Word, and I do remind you that in uh, Matthew 25, when they were uh, gathered before the Lord, they said, you know, well, they said, have we not done many wonderful works in, in your name? And I, I, think that, I think the inference is that they actually did some wonderful works in his name, but he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Lord loves me. I know that I will give an account, an accounting. There will be an accounting, but not uh, for sin, not judgment for sin. Joseph's brothers will not be judged for the sin that they committed 
in conspiring against their brother. Okay, that's, that's not it. They will give an account for their attitude. I'll give an account for, for how, for why I built on Christ. And God knows my heart. And he's doing the building. He is doing the building. And I know that when I stand before the Lord's uh, fire, his holiness, and that that fire, when that fire is ignited, that my building, my building will burn up. My building, okay? God's doing the building. There'll be loss, but, but his building, his work can't be burned up. The work that he does. The text is going to confirm that there will be on the one side of the scale, gold, silver, precious stone, just as there will be on the other side of it, hay, wood, and stubble. I see these as two things, not six, okay? You know, sometimes I have people say to me, well, you know, I don't care about gold, silver, and precious stones as long as I just get to heaven. That's all that matters to me. I, that's my main concern is I make it, okay? I don't care whether I have, you know, gold, silver, or precious stone, stone or anything. I just, I just don't want to go to hell. You know, I, I don't care what happens, you know, which is the same thing as saying, well, I don't care about any reward from God. Uh, I don't care what God wants. Doesn't matter to me. You know, it doesn't matter to me whether I should study to show myself approved or not approved or I just want to make it to heaven. You know, and I, I know I will because he died in my place. Yeah. Folks, isn't that really demeaning God? I mean, it, it's it's like me saying to my wife, well, I don't care about anything as long as you feed me or, or something, you know. What kind of a relationship is that? If God tells me that he has a crown for those who love his appearing and I don't care about that crown, <laughs> you know, aren't I saying that I don't care what God thinks is good? I mean, how many of us really love his appearing? You know, you know here's sister so-and-so you know, just, she just ordered new carpet. You know, I hope he doesn't come until we get the new carpet installed. You know, I mean, come on. It seems to me like somehow we got our values mixed up. You know, brother, brothers, brother, I, well, I just ordered a BMW. You know, I sure hope I drive it at least a little bit before the Lord comes back, you know, or something like that. Do we really love his appearing? What is your motive, folks? Wood, hay, stubble? Well, that what is wood? Well, what is gold, silver, precious stone? Well, that's going to church on Sunday morning, you know, or a thousand other other things. Is that building on Christ? I think that's just pure legalism. Uh All I want you to do is take heed how you build because there's no other foundation on which to build than Jesus Christ. And I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't want any other foundation. Christ loved me so, so much that he left heaven's glory, redeeming me by dying in my place. He didn't have to do that, but he did. I urge you, says the Holy Spirit, to accept and believe that I am the sovereign God, and I exhort you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, that you don't make provision, provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, to live your life to the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. There is no way no way that we can change the sovereign determined will of God. No way we can change the sovereign action of God. They've been decreed before time began. 
Our accounting is how we live and how we respond to God in light of those sovereign actions of God. You know, what happens, folks, in your life is of God. You know, he has complete control. He works together for your good. He's working in you to will and do of his good pleasure. Nothing touches you. Nothing touches your life that doesn't come through his loving hands. But what is your attitude? Let every man take heed how he builds. God is causing the increase. We are not causing the increase. We're not. So it's not the increase that's in question. It's the attitude. It's, it's the motive. It's, it's, how, it's how we build. There are many passages of Scripture that a great segment of Christianity reads as though, you know, it's all done through our own strength, our own wisdom, our own performance, our own... It's not. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You know, that's up to you. What is not up to you is what happens in your life. You know, it's a, it's a very easy thing to say, well, you know, I made that mistake. You know, it wasn't God's, God's fault, you know. I mean, God's totally out of this. I'm not blaming God. It wasn't his fault. He wasn't in control. I was. You know, and I made this stupid mistake. You know, oh I, oh, I would never blame God, but in fact, you are blaming God. The very one who says he's working all things together for your good. We should take heed how we build. We shouldn't make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We should flee youthful lusts, which war against the soul. We should walk worthy of the vocation we're in or wherewith we're called. All of those exhortations, and you'll read more of those. There's a lot of them. All of those are from our, our, our loving Heavenly Father. All of those will not change what God has ordained for your life, but it will change you. He's the sovereign monarch of, of eternity. He's, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He hung the stars in the sky. He's the almighty God. No one, no one can stand before him except through Christ. I mean, the whole nation of Israel couldn't stand before him. You know, they all moved back and, and fell down. Soldiers who came to arrest him fell to the ground. That's the God that we serve. That's the God with whom we have to deal, and every one of us will give an accounting of how willingly, how trustingly we responded to God as it concerned His work in our lives. I mean, you know, uh, it's your fault, right? I mean, you didn't have a good marriage. You don't have a good job. You don't like the city you're living in. You know, it's all, everything's your fault. Your wife doesn't obey you. Your, your kids don't I, either. Your husband's not nice. And, you know, we could go on and on and on. I hear this all the time, but God is directing your steps, folks. He's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Every single thing that happens to you, to you today. And every day. And that same will of God is at work in the world around us. It's also in the, at work in the world around us. This crazy upside down world that we see around us. You know, I, I was going to report on what was going on in the world, you know. It, you know, uh, well, I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, that would be it. You know, I tell you, I stand before my loving Heavenly Father trembling. All right. Life goes by very quickly. Let every man take heed how he builds upon Christ. There's no other foundation. What you have, dearly beloved, is a privilege to be used by God in some aspect of that building. 
and, and how did you do it? As unto the Lord, or did you sell your brother into slavery because you hated him? If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, you know, uh, and, and, and now for those of you who are into the Greek, uh, you know that there are no conjunctions there, you know. They're not separated by ands. It's not gold and silver and so There's no conjunctions. That means that the Holy Spirit wants us to look at these as a whole, not as individual concepts. So I'm suggesting that we're only looking at two things, okay? Gold, silver, precious stone, hay, wood, and stone. Two things. Flesh and spirit. I don't, and I don't believe that these are building materials, and there are, and there's hundreds of sermons preached, and, and and I don't know how many articles written. You know that, that these are the materials used in the building. You know, uh, there's there are many who've argued. Uh, well, I, I can understand the wood, and 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 I'm not real sure about the hay, but you know what is the stubble? You know. Oh, oh, oh! I know what that is. The stubble. That's when they, uh, that's when they make they mix the straw in with the they to make bricks. They put that in there. That help keeps the brick together. And and boy, that's that's to me that's really pushing the white spaces. Okay. I think we're talking about how you build, and the way you build is either one way or the other. Okay, gold, silver, precious stone, or hay, wood, stubble. Uh, I don't think one second of your life has been wasted, even if you did, you know, time like Paul chained to a Roman guard or, or, or like John exiled to a Greek island in the Aegean Sea. Your life has never, not one moment has been wasted from God's perspective folks and and we are being shown that it is our life's work singular okay that is being judged not works plural okay motive attitude is the question here you know i think god will use hay wood and stubble for his own majestic glory whatever that is You know, we'll all have hay, wood, stubble, as well as gold, silver, precious stone. I have to say from the text that it's a mixture since there's no no conjunctions between the the two, the, these six things that are listed here. You know, I think the way that you build is, is a mixture of those two, and, and there's the judgment of God. You know, it's called fire here, and maybe it's literal fire. I don't know. But clearly, that's a good word to use for God's judgment since it, uh, it tries a man's entire life's work. And I'm going to stop right here. About 40 minutes into the video, we'll pick up next time. I think it's interesting that we're here at the present time, given everything that's going on around us. Uh, scripture seems to, in a strange way, sort of follow our lives. You know, it seems. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you're all well. Dearly beloved, rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.